Hi. Um, I think some of you or most of you have looked at the web, uh, web page or the Facebook page about um, that I'm talking how adversity pre breeds creativity. And some ask even if this is based on the talk of the power of why, which my friend has given 2009. And um, my answer to this is, yes, I agree. Um, I think he screwed up the circles, if you have seen the presentation. Because for me, it starts with the why, and then it goes to the what, and then the how. Because one easy reason why you should never have in the circle after you have questioned why am I doing something, or why would one of my customers, why would anything happen, you shouldn't automatically go into the how do I make it happen, because then you have something which I call, and anybody under 21 here? Anyone under 18? Anybody not have heard the word shit before? <laughs> Okay, so I can use it. Uh, the oh shit moment, I call it. So you have an idea, and it's a great idea. You know, really, like, you're working for a company, you have this great, great idea, you want to do it, and then you wake up and you say, oh shit, if I tell my boss I actually have to do it. <laughs> That's when you go from the why, because you have a great idea, why, it makes a lot of sense, but the how is where you get stuck. Oh, it can never be done. It's the valley. You know, because it's the valley, it can't be done. I will not get access to capital anyway. So why would I bother even to tell somebody, right? That's the problem. Never go into the how first. Have this very healthy behavior in saying there's nothing impossible. In my companies, and I might look only like I'm 25, but uh, I'm actually a little bit older. I'm doing this since 30 years. In my companies, there are two reasons you get fired. Reason number one is you steal or you lie, which is the same. No, reason number two is you tell somebody it can't be done. Then you're out. There's never an answer it can't be done. Maybe it can't be done now. Maybe it can't be done by this team. But nothing is impossible. And if you believe that, then you free up your head again to the power of why. And the why goes much deeper than you know, the nice TED Talks or whatsoever are given. The why starts with social compact. Why are we behaving in a certain way? It's genetic. We are only here, you see, we don't run as fast as a lion. I lived 14 years in Africa, so uh, uh, I apologize for all the animal uh, things that I say. But we're not as fast as a lion. We're not as strong as a gorilla. We're not even as intelligent as some of the animals on this planet. We're not. But we have figured out how to live with our shortcomings and to turn them into strengths. Every time we tackle a challenge, what happens? We have this little thing sitting in our brain that says, creativity. How do I work around? How do I become, and you are, guys are mostly too young, MacGyver? Ever heard anybody of <laughs> MacGyver? I did. I grew up with him. Not, not in his house, but you know, I don't think he had one. Um, you know, you, you're creating creativity. And this is what is currently the currency in this world, not access to capital. Somebody will make this happen. Somebody here in the valley thinks that it's possible to have an angel network that throws money at people in the valley who can't even finish my house in renovations because they're all running away, the subcontractors. I don't know why, sorry. I haven't figured that out. But the excuse of the valley doesn't count in terms of access to capital. Solved. So don't tell me you can't get capital. What is the resource here is the shortcomings of the valley. Not everything is easily accessible. Not every time you flick the light switch, the light actually comes on. If I tell my friends that in Germany you can't buy a surge protector, go to an electronic superstore and it's not 
that our electronic superstores are smaller than your electronic superstores. We have pretty big electronic superstores. But you will not be able to buy UPS unless they're specialized on servers. And you will not be able to buy a search protector. Because in Germany, the light does not flicker. We don't have searches. We don't have power cuts. They don't exist. So nobody in his right mind in Germany would come to the idea to build the world's best search protector in UPS. And we could, because that's what we do, you know. <laughs> we build machines, and they're better. But are we creative in Germany? Shocker, no, we are not. Why are we not creative in Germany? Because we don't have to be. We wait for somebody to have a problem. This somebody says we would need a machine that does X, Y, and Z, and we do it. That's not creativity. And that is something, an art, that is disappearing. Because breaking news, knowledge is free. <coughs> you might pay fees for the university for now. But in real time, knowledge is free. Thinking becomes more and more valuable. Creativity becomes more and more valuable because knowledge becomes freer and freer and freer. It's called Google. I worked there four years. You, know, you type it in. As long as you can type, it gives you all the information you could never store in your head. Right? So why the heck are you paying at the university to learn something? <laughs> Because you learn how to connect the dots. A machine can't do this. You feel what a machine can't do. You will know why something works and something doesn't. But your why shouldn't start straight away with a product. Why would somebody eat a burger? Because it's hungry, yes? No, but why would you create the best burger? You have the best recipe? Forget it. You will never have the best food. I consult a lot of restaurant businesses. You will not sell more food because your food is good. Every food is good, technically, out there. There are so many different tastes. You will lose customers if your food is not good. But you don't gain them with good food. What you are selling is a perception. Why are they coming to you? Because of an experience, because of a perception. How do you do this? Comes after what are they actually expecting? You know, what is your picture for this perception? Like fine dining is candlelight, right? Is it really? Actually, candlelight is cheaper than electricity, right? And it makes smoke, and it's bad for the environment, and the oceans will rise. <laughs> Sorry. I'm, I'm very liberal, but I'm not a Democrat. So, <laughs> um, so what is it? Yes, you're playing with the perception. You're playing with human brains. In every business you're doing, the creativity that you have to bring that makes you better than your competitor, that makes you better than the machine that might want to create a product is you can feel what is the why of your customer and your staff. And I believe strongly it's staff first, customer second, and shareholder third. I want to be part of the angel network, but I have never seen an angel investor in my life. Because it's not called Shark Tank for nothing. They don't want your best. There might be some good in their heart, but an angel investor wants to have an early bite at the cherry when it's very sweet, right? Takes a higher risk, but takes a higher return. You understand this, that's the why for the angel investor. There's nothing wrong with it, but understand it on a human level, on a feelings level. So you are asking yourself, why would I go for money right now if I can stretch it a little bit? And a little tip when you speak to an angel investor, the first question that I usually ask as an angel with a shark um, is, 
What's the salary you are drawing? What do you think is a good answer? You're working 18 hours a day to make that product work. How much salary should you draw? Zero. Zero. Any other, any other answer? And you're so quickly out of the door. Because again, why, if you believe so much in your product, would you take money? Yes, you have to feed yourself. But the angel investor will not be interested in. So what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Why am I not in Silicon Valley and still drawing six figures? Because I believe I can draw much bigger figures here, sooner or later, by helping to develop the valley. That's my why. I'm in the business of growing people. I do classical consulting for big companies. That's interesting. That's a puzzle. That's like Dr. House. You come to me, you say, where it hurts, and I figure out what's wrong. Thrills me, makes me happy. But what makes me really happy is if somebody comes to me and says, I, I have this feeling, feeling, hmm? there is something that is missing in the, in the lives of people around here. So what do we do about it? Why would somebody come to me and I help him to fill this little gap in his life? Like a UPS or like a nice burger. If you can explain this to me, if you can explain why you are passionate about it, you personally passionate about it, meaning you tune into the feelings and the energy that is created by that feeling, you have a business. No kidding. If you match up, and I did this funny exercise when I was at this company that provided me unlimited computing power when I needed it. I'm not saying which one it was. But um, if you match all the hobbies of everybody in the world with what needs to be produced, you would overproduce. So in reality, if everybody was not working but just doing their hobby, and you match this around and there was no local restrictions, there's a little bit logistics involved, I would say, you would overproduce in the world and nobody would ever work. I have a prognosis and, I mean, this is re being recorded, so sooner or later somebody can hold me to it. I have a prognosis that in a few years you will pay to work. You will no longer get paid to work, you will pay to work. Because you will work your hobby and you will otherwise die of boredom. Look at the, the whole system. If you work, you work l shorter and shorter hours in some of the countries. We automate more and more. Creativity shrinks and shrinks. So that you have more time to spend more money on your hobbies. And the only reason you go working is so you can finance your hobbies. Now, why don't you make your hobby productive? And most of the hobbies you can make productive. You like fishing? Bring fish, right? It's a hobby if you do it like this, but it's an income source if you feed somebody with the fish. Go back to 60,000 years ago. Live the social compacts. Live them in, uh, in your companies if you found companies, if you work in the companies, challenge your bosses and ask them, you know, without big rule works, without regulations of hundreds and thousands of pages, the human race did pretty well. And in my opinion, every regulation will lead in a bubble and a burst. So if you set up your companies, if you come to me, I will help you. I'm one of those mentors, even if I'm not associated with the incubator yet, but even if you come to me in Brownsville and you say, hey, I have this idea, I feel, I feel passionate about it, I can make it work, I will translate your dolphin speak, because being passionate <laughs> is dolphin, yeah? <laughs> and I bring you to a shark and help you to speak shark, where you say, so much in, so much contribution, so much out, exit strategy, Last opportunity, give me the money or go out of, out of this door here, quickly. 
You speak that language, you're more likely to get the money than to be passionate. But to get help from me, please come as a dolphin. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Oh, personal story. Um, I was the shyest kid on the block when I was 15. No kidding. I, hi I was hiding under the bed when relatives came visit. So I had the perfect job because I was smoking already. Don't ask me why. Um, has to do with childhood and stuff. Um, so I was working in the basement of a guy who was doing something which is called building computers. Yeah. So I was very happy that nobody spoke to me. I was the nerdy type in the basement with this little DRAM chips and was doing this and building great computers. And then he went bankrupt and I bought the company and then the rest just followed and I went to Africa and turned around the tourism company because I wanted to definitely solve puzzles and then built the more world's most modern fiber network in the is still in Kenya. It's now called Liquid Telecom. You can Google that or Bing it or whatever you want to do with it. I would Google it. You, you get a good result. So I, I built a fiber network. We sold the network. Google snatched me up as a consultant first. And later on, they thought I should build for a few billion dollars a fiber network around the world. I wrote the business case for Project Loon, which is the balloons that are going around the, the globe. I wrote the business case for this. I did Project Link, which is fiber networks in, in a few countries. Um, and then I had enough of corporate politics and um, I thought I'd go somewhere where people deserve opportunity and where I have something I don't have in the Silicon Valley, which is creative minds who, that live through adversity. In the Silicon Valley, again, everything is there. If you do a startup in the Silicon Valley, you talk $5 million upwards. You want to do prototyping, $250,000 to make a stupid bucket. I can have it in Africa for somebody who says, yeah, sir, give me five minutes, you know? And if you pay me $5, I'm happy, I make a profit. And he makes me the same bucket as a prototype. So where do I go? My why is growing people. My why, I find where people still have challenges to solve. And one thing you are not short of here in the valley is challenges. <coughs> yeah. So that's my personal story. Enough? I, I, You've been here for how long? Uh, I bought the house in 2010. I moved here officially in 2011. I was last year 300 days, uh, not last year, 2014, 300 days somewhere in airports and other countries. But uh, technically since 2011, the 5th of July 2011, I'm a permanent resident of the valley. I was in Harlingen last year, my wife divorced me, so now I'm in Brownsville. She didn't want me at home, I guess. <laughs> Fresh wounds. Only 28 years together, sorry. Personal story. And oh, one thing about me, I don't have secrets. I keep secrets of my, of my clients, but I have no secrets. Sorry. Um, can you tell us uh, which project you worked on you were like most excited to be on? Like, I guess whether it's your first company or a product at Google that you're like, oh wow, this is amazing, you know? The uh, <laughs> <laughs> so one that made you talk like a dolphin. <laughs> yes. Something that makes me talk like a dolphin is the project that you bring to me tomorrow. That's not. That's not just a saying, it's, it's always waking up tomorrow morning, everything hurts because I don't sleep really that much and I'm excited about the new day that starts. So I'm, I'm a dolphin when it comes to what's going to happen tomorrow. What I love, like the, uh, last year one of my protégés, she submitted her dissertation about IT security. She started as a junior accounts clerk in my company and I mentored her, and now she is one of the leading ladies for IT security. And she um, designated her dissertation to her family, her cats, and me. 
<laughs> so I, that made me very, very excited. Uh, a product I liked a lot was, for example, yield management on how to figure out how to make yield management work on uh, freight airports or freight flights. I found this very exciting. So I asked me. And there's another project which never took off, but it should take off, which is called Kaskazi. That's basically how you buy a potato from a farmer in Kenya, and I have solved all the problems in between about supplier and, and who is getting what and by, by a barter system. But that will not happen because before that everybody will shoot me because it would really disrupt trading systems. Even, even my old bosses were a little bit scared because it works. Does it involve blockchains for potatoes? Huh? Does it involve blockchains? Of course, of course. I might be a little bit excited about Bitcoin, yes. <laughs> just, just a little bit, yeah. And the, the point is, why was money created? So you don't have to transport the product from A to B, but you can still make a trade between A to B if, if, if it's distance by a proxy in between, which is called money. Now, we have forgotten that, I guess. So if I say buy a potato from Kenya, you think, how does somebody ship me the potato from Kenya? But he could give it to somebody else who gives them a piece of broccoli, who then gives it to a hotel which serves the tourist the beer. And in the end, you have a potato from Idaho, but the farmer in Kenya has gotten the money for it. That's something I'm still excited about, but I don't think I will ever get it off the ground because it's dangerous. Don't record that. <laughs> Um, you had mentioned coming to you when we have um, those ideas that we're passionate about. What's, what's the official process that you'd like for us to do? Just call you up and say, I want to meet with you and that's that? Or Send me an email say I'm passionate about something. And uh, if you send me a little outline, I usually don't sign NDAs if you want. I sign an NDA for you. I can Google one. There are plenty around. They're not worth the paper they're printed on, but it's OK. <laughs> Um, just, just send me a quick email say I'm passionate about something and I have an idea. And I'm nasty. I sit you down and I will question your why. I will question why somebody would buy it, why somebody would be interested in this product. If you convince me, you have me as a, as a mentor. We figure out the commercials later. Usually what I do is if I'm very passionate and I mentor somebody, I take a stake in the company. I don't charge. Startups, I don't charge. So I'm an angel investor in terms of sweat equity. And so far, I can still feed myself and I feed my family. And even my ex-wife is not unhappy. So <laughs> seems to be working. Who have you worked with down here? Who have I worked with down here? Um, two clients who are doing uh, medical monitoring, then uh, a lot of restaurants. I have worked with... Um, Dairy Queen, for example. That's now your traditional site in, in terms. And we have uh, the bucket company, then one that makes funny straps for backpacks. I can't tell you more because they're not yet patented. So that's, and I have saved a lot of people who were very passionate about a product and I've saved them from actually spending money on time on that product by letting them fail very quickly in front of me just asking the right questions. I'm, I'm actually proud of those ones as well that never make it because you save them a lot of hassle. How did you get into restaurant consulting? I have Crohn's. So since very early, I'm very restricted in what I can eat. Um, after my partner in this first computer company cheated me, one of my clients had a small little Mexican restaurant and I blew this up to a franchise and we sold it. Um, I was always passionate about food and healthy food and good food and um, restaurant consulting is a lot of puzzles you can create and you're serving smiles. My why is to make people happy, I told you. Grow people, make them happy, you know, give them an experience. And restaurant business is perfect for that. So if I consult, even if it's a dairy queen, if I consult them, they're not in the business of making ice cream. 
they should be in the business of serving smiles. That's the why. You go there for your sugar kick, you know. <laughs> you don't go there because of the nutritional value of an ice cream. But I can still make it better. So that's, that's why restaurants are so close to my heart. And I'm a pretty good chef nowadays. Yes? Uh, what's your educational background? I have a PhD in economics, a bachelor in IT, and a bachelor in marketing and uh, a hotel management diploma, and whatever you throw at me, I must do some. I have a commercial pilot license. Uh, what else? I'm allowed to drive war tanks and forklifts. And <laughs> Don't get me started. I'm, I'm a sucker for these this papers, you know, that say I'm, I'm allowed to do it. <laughs> and then I do the stuff that I don't have a paper for. <laughs> No medical marijuana in this state. Do you offer internships within the company? Yes, I do. Come to me, badly paid, <laughs> sucker as a boss, you know, really bad, high pressure cooker, but yes. <laughs> I think you, you will get my, my details, so the more the better. And we start with small companies. I'm not necessarily going to put you in front of Warren Buffett tomorrow, who owns Dairy Queen, and say, you know, consult him. He, he might be the, the, the gray white, the big white, you know, like. There's been a lot of, uh, I guess, enthusiasm for SpaceX. Mm -hmm. From your opinion, is that the solution for the valley? Or or it does it start with us? Because I think the part of your conversation was more that there's a lot of challenges, there's a lot of there's a lot of things, but if you worry about the how, then you're never going to get anything done. Could you could you talk to us a little bit about like what is going to take for us to become our own? It doesn't have to be our own, like Silicon Valley, but could you talk to us about how what is going to take for us to to have our own startup community? Uh, I mean, just just think about. What is the area good at, passionate about it? What is DNA ingrained in the area? If you, if you look at the area as a person, as something like, you have agriculture, of course. You have resources, which are called great weather. Yeah? You have the sea out there. You have a lot of land, I would say, and you have a lot of clever people. That's, that's your basis for a solution. SpaceX is a nice start. Nothing against it. But beware of the silver bullet. That's a lecture I gave in Africa for many, many, many years. Because when I came to Kenya, for example, it was like, we will develop when we have multi-party democracy. I came to Kenya in 96, 97. Um, the biggest killing happened in post-election violence or before the election actually in 97 because now we had multi-party coming up and they were voting al along tribal lines so they did some ethnic cleansing in certain areas so it's like you're rezoning between Republicans and Democrats just on a violent basis but it's exactly the same you draw your lines so you get your electoral votes depending on the line that are with your tribe. So that was not a silver bullet, right? It didn't solve all the problems of Kenya. Then we had the next discussion. 2001 will be, everything will be changed because before we get a mobile phone network, then everybody will be fully informed. Didn't really change anything. Then we have a new president, everything will change. And then we will liberalize telecoms. I was still in tourism, then they liberalized telecoms with my Green Book approach, which I had helped them to write, which is the German basically transfer infrastructure and services separated. This is how a fiber company was possible. And then everything will be solved. We bring submarine cable systems, then everything will be solved. No, it's all of the above and more. That's, that's the solution. And you have to believe in yourself. That's the biggest challenge here in the valley. That's the biggest challenge in many countries in Africa. Don't use the excuse, I'm in the valley, say, hey, I'm lucky I'm in the valley. Once that mindset changes, then you have made the step. Not, oh, yeah, it's the valley, I'm in the valley, I have to get out of here. What I always say is Rome wasn't built in one day, 
but the Romans didn't bloody leave. <coughs> they didn't go to Austin. <laughs> right? And you guys, how many of you, very honest, I, as I said, I don't have secrets, how many of you think they're doing their diploma and if they get the chance to be snatched up in Silicon Valley, snatched up in Austin, snatched up in Dallas, snatched up in Houston, they will be, wow, I'm out of here. How many of you have thought about that? Come on. Honest, honest, honest. More honesty. I've done it before. Okay. So half? And the other half are lying. Yeah. <laughs> or, or the other, other half is so stuck into, I will not make it anyway. I'll yeah? Come back. So for yeah. someone that's been here for such a short time, your perception of the Valley residents is basically someone that doesn't want to live here. Is that, is that what you've been perceiving, basically? It's, yeah. Yes. Yes. That, because we know, but we didn't know it was that obvious. Someone that just it's very obvious. Came here. Yes, and this is what I do. I mean, I I'm not a consultant. I'm a behavioral analyst, because I'm trying to manage and create companies along the lines of the social compact. How humans behave anyway. You structure a company against the social compact. You have to put in controls. If you structure a company that is very similar to the social compact, you don't have to do anything. It controls itself. Humans have lived pretty well together. I would personally, if I had any say, you know I'm a small guy, I'm a small fish, not a big shark, but if a CEO comes at a bad quarter and says, I have, to, I have a solution for the problem why we didn't make enough money, is we fire 6,000 people. If I was an investor, I would fire the CEO. Because his job is to figure out what to do with the 6,000 people. His job is to spur creativity that there's always a pipeline out there. What do humans do when the environment becomes hostile? What did we do 60,000 years ago? Did we shrink our group? Did we throw cranny over the fence? What, what did the Republicans, no, the Democrats say in the, in the wheelchair over the cliff? You know? No, we made the group bigger, because bigger groups means more power. What are we doing here in our, in our capitalistic system, which is actually not, no longer really capitalism? We shrink the group when times are bad. That's counterproductive, because the next time you want to grow the company again, you're hiring those HR experts and agencies and whatsoever and you pay another commission to get people back into your company. And that is the same here. The valley is weak, so what do we do? We run away, we make it weaker. That's self-fulfilling prophecy. And it's obvious. It's really, really obvious. And it's sad. And I get asked. Every time I go to a client and they say, why are you in the valley? And I say, why wouldn't I? <laughs> You know, for me, it's, it's, I, I wouldn't build my house in New York City city center because I couldn't afford it and there's no plot free. So why am I in the valley? Because there's a lot of creative minds which I can poison with my talks. <laughs> and hopefully, once in a while, somebody stays around and does some work with me. <laughs>